Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you very much for joining us for the last uh, but one day of this two-week ASNIC Virtual Nuclear Cardiology Elective. I'm very pleased to introduce to you our speaker today, Dr. Timothy Bateman, who is the co-director of the Cardiologic Cardiovascular Radiologic Imaging Program at St. Luke's and a professor of medicine at the University of Missouri, Kansas City School of Medicine. Dr. Bateman is a past president of the American Society of Nuclear Cardiology and the incoming president of the Cardiovascular Council of the Society of Nuclear Medicine and Molecular Imaging. He is a world-renowned expert in cardiac PET and he's being joined today by members of his team, including Dr. Ian Meggie, Dr. Krishna Patel, and others. The topic for today's discussion is cardiac PET myocardial perfusion imaging. And Dr. Bateman, the stage is yours. Well, hello, uh, everyone, and uh, thanks for joining in today. Um, I am going to uh, co-host today's session with Dr. Ian McGee. Uh, the two of us have worked together for more than 20 years. Uh, we introduced uh, PET to this practice in uh, the year 2000, so we've got a little bit around 20 years uh, experience with, uh, with cardiac PET. Uh, it has become the dominant uh, technology uh, that we use in our nuclear cardiology lab uh, here within the St. Luke's Health System. Uh, Dr. McGee will go over some of those uh, specifics, but uh, at this point, we've got uh, four, cardi four scanners that are pretty much dedicated to uh, cardiac PET uh, imaging. Um, so we're going to try to uh, convince you uh, today uh, about you know, why we made those changes. Uh, and you'll see uh, why we are so happy uh, with the uh, steps that we took uh, 20 years ago. And uh, we're gonna teach you as much as we can during this uh, two hours about uh, myocardial perfusion imaging with PET. Now, uh, I've been asked to say a few things. You've, you've all probably seen this before. It's a bit boring to you, but uh, a quick moment for housekeeping. Uh, everybody is muted by default. Uh, we will have a question and answer session at the end of the presentation, so we will end a few minutes early. To talk, you have to click on the microphone icon to unmute on the uh, bottom bar. Please keep your microphone muted unless you are actually speaking. This helps to minimize the background noise, and please uh, have your video camera turned off. To post the questions, you just click the chat at the bottom of your screen. Once you click that, a window will open on the right of the screen and everybody can see what you are saying. Uh, please keep the comments pertinent to the material. Uh, there will be several people uh, from here monitoring uh, the comments and, and uh, bringing them to our attention so that we can, uh, we can uh, answer them. Uh, when we are in, are in full screen mode, we cannot, we personally as, as presenters cannot see the questions. So, uh, so uh, Kyle and Krishna and Yashu, feel free to uh, in, uh, interrupt us if you see an interesting question. Uh, to raise your hand at the bottom of the screen, click participants, click on raise your hand. Unmute audio from that uh, action. This, like all the other presentations, are being recorded. All slides in the presentation are HIPAA compliant. Uh, and uh, we appreciate uh, your, your feedback. So at this time, I'm going to introduce Dr. McGee to you. And uh, he can say a few words of personal introduction. And then he is going to uh, speak on uh, the broad topic of PET and how it compares to SPECT. And then uh, I will take over and we will talk about specifics of myocardial blood flow quantification. And after that, we have a large number of cases that we are going to go over. Dr. McGee. As uh, Tim Bayman was saying, uh, we've been doing that for about uh, 20 years now. And uh, we currently have uh, four uh, PET scanners. They're all PET CT scanners uh, located th 
throughout the Kansas City, Missouri area. We do in the region of between an eight and 9,000 um, perfusion studies per year, and about 60% of those are with uh, PET. Um, so I'm, what I'm gonna to talk today about is some of the, the technical aspects of uh, PET. I know that uh, you've had some lectures on SPECT already, and I just want to highlight some of the differences between um, uh, PET and SPECT. So uh, two important principles to understand with PET imaging is uh, uh, annihilation. So two of the important things to uh, first talk about is the, the annihilation reaction and also the uh, coincidence detection, because they're, they're pretty fundamental things to understand is when it comes to PET imaging. Uh, so a positron is a small particle, a uh, small mass, uh, but it's positively charged. And you can think of it as a positively charged electron. So it's emitted by a positron, in, uh, a positron emitting isotope, and then it travels a short distance uh, before uh, colliding with an electron. When it collides with the electron, all the mass is converted to energy. And then what happens is, uh, two important things happen. There's two gamma rays emitted and they have the energy of 511 keV. And that's 511 keV um, is the same for whatever, you know, uh, positron emitting radioisotope you use, whether that be rubidium or ammonia or uh, fluorine. So uh, then the other and second important thing to remember is that these uh, gamma rays are emitted at 180 degrees uh, to one another, or pretty close to 180 degrees. And that's what's called an annihilation reaction. So you're not actually imaging positrons. A lot of people think they're imaging positrons, they're not. We're, we're imaging high energy uh, gamma rays. So if we focus up now to the top left part of the screen, you can see there's an, an annihilation, annihilation reaction occurring in the heart. And we can see the gamma rays uh, going out at 180 degrees to one another. And surrounding the patient is a PET scanner. And the PET scanner has a series of rings of detectors uh, circulating the body, uh, uh, encompassing the body. And if there is an event uh, recorded in two detectors 180 degrees apart, within a short time period, and when I mean a short time period, I mean somewhere in the region of uh, less than 10 nanoseconds, at, at nanoseconds, it kind of depends on the camera, different cameras have different um, uh, time windows. But if, uh, if you get uh, 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 an event occurring uh, within the time frame 180 degrees apart, then that's called a coincidence event. And that coincidence event is uh, registered and uh, that data is used by the computer to uh, generate uh, an image. So here we see on the left hand side, we see these two uh, photons going off at 180 degrees to one another being detected by detectors uh, 180 degrees apart. Um, so the principle of um, uh, this coincidence uh, detection uh, uh, is important because uh, unlike SPECT imaging where you have got physical, uh, usually lead collimators uh, to uh, reject bad data and good data, with PAT is done electronically. And this is very important because uh, it means that the, um, the efficiency of the, the, the scanner is much higher than you, with typically that you would get with a gamma camera. So you get markedly improved count statistics and a much better spatial resolution. And here you can see uh, you, there are many uh, rings of detectors uh, adjacent to, to one another uh, comprising the PET scanner. In fact, there's, and these, there are thousands of detectors um, uh, in, a, in a, a PET scanner and they're all joined together ele electronically uh, uh, in the camera. So here's up to tech, uh, you can see the, the front, here's the crystal um, measuring somewhere in the region of, uh, you know, four to six millimeters by two to three centimeters. 
the newer cameras are, have got smaller detectors. Uh, then behind that, you have the uh, photomultiplier tubes that, that you know amplify the light and electronics for positioning, amplification, energy discrimination, etc. And all that data is sent to uh, a coincidence timing circuitry. Um, some of the newer scanners that are coming out over the last couple of years are digital scanners, which are getting rid of the, the, the PM tubes and got uh, much got even higher sensitivity than these uh, 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 analog scanners that are what available that are available most commonly right now. The uh, it depends on the camera what the crystals are made out of. Uh, scanners we have our Steeman scanners. They are LSOs, but you can kind of uh, uh, GSO uh, and BGO uh, uh, detectors too. And they've got all different types of uh, uh, characteristics, which I don't think we need to get into at this stage. So not all the coincidence events are good events. Uh, so here on the left-hand side, we see a, a, a true coincidence uh, occurring. You see the annihilation uh, reaction occurring and uh, the two gamma rays going off at 180 degrees and getting detected uh, by the detectors and registered as true coincidence. In the middle panel, you can see an, an one annihilation event, and uh, you see one uh, gamma ray going off at 180 degrees. Um, but on the other side, you see that uh, one of the gamma rays gets scattered, and uh, instead of going at 180 degrees apart from the other uh, the gamma ray, it's been deflected. And uh, that line of response uh, we're talking about uh, is going to be different and it's going to be false. So that's going to be false data that you want to uh, you know, reject. And then on the final uh, panel on the right hand side, we can see two annihilation uh, events occurring. Uh, and on the left, you can see one going uh, gamma ray going down to one of the detectors. Uh, gets registered, and then another gamma ray from another annihilation event is getting detected at 180 degrees uh, from the other one, and that is getting uh, registered as a coincidence event, and again, that is going to be uh, false. And the, the, the scanners uh, correct for that using software and uh, energy di uh, discrimination. So, um, that's uh, important to know. But even despite the, you know, the high prevalence of scatter and random coincidence, the inherent sensitivity of these scanners is much higher than for gamma cameras. A lot of the near scanners and something you probably, you might hear about, something called time of flight. So the, the conventional PET scanners didn't have, uh, don't have uh, time of flight uh, compensation in them. And, uh, so we can see here, we got this uh, um, LOR uh, going across uh, from one side uh, of the detector to the other and caused by the two gamma rays coming out at 180 degrees uh, from one another. But you can't really tell where uh, along that line that uh, annihilation event occurred. You can just see it's gonna be somewhere along that line. With the time of flight, uh, the scanners, uh, there, there's enough temporal uh, resolution uh, to try and figure out, not precisely, but with some statistical probability, exactly where that event occurred. So you can see at the bottom there, you could see perhaps that the uh, first, um, there's going to be one gamma array that's going to be closer to, to the detector, so it's going to arrive earlier. And then the one that's further away is obviously going to arrive later. And we can compensate, we can take the, into account the difference uh, in the time taken to travel and uh, back, uh, we, we can fi figure out exactly, or not exactly, but close to where that actual annihilation occurred. And that results in uh, a lot better uh, contrast resolution uh, and uh, higher quality images. The next, uh, and one of the most important uh, processes in PET scanning is attenuation correction. Now, a lot of the early PET scanners, the first couple of PET scanners we had were these dedicated PET scanners. And uh, what uh, happens here is to get your attenuation map, we would use uh, the, the PET scanners would be fitted with a uh, 
an orbiting rod, uh, typically a germanium 68, some, uh, that would rotate around the, uh, would circle around the body um, before we, any isotope was injected into the patient and then an attenuation map would be um, formed. Okay. Um, so you get the, uh, an attenuation map, and then that is used um, along with the uh, transmission uh, sinogram uh, to, to um, result in a, an attenuated corrected image. However, uh, in the current era, most PET scanners are, uh, are, 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 are made for uh, oncologic imaging for FDG imaging, where localization of the activity is very, very important. Uh, so most uh, PET scanners nowadays um, are uh, PET CT scanners. And there the CT scanner is used to uh, uh, make the attenuation image. So you get, the, the, you get a, a CT scan that uh, is then converted to uh, a 511 KEV attenuation map, and then that is applied to the the emission data uh, to uh, create a attenuation corrected image. So that's all very well and good and we get uh, lovely pictures most of the time, but you really have to be aware of quality and quality with pet imaging is a little bit more difficult uh, to, uh, uh, to figure out than when compared to spec imaging. Uh, one of the major issues that if you're not careful is uh, misregistration. So on the left-hand panel, and if you look up at the top left-hand image, we can see an overlay of the emission data, uh, of the, in this case, rubidium, and uh, the uh, attenuation map. And you can see up at the top here that the antralateral wall is not inside the mediastinum and it's in the lung. So that part of the myocardium is going to get a less uh, attenuation uh, correction than the rest of the heart. And if you look down below, you can see that that lateral wall uh, appears to be uh, hypoperfused, but it's not at all hypoperfused. It's because it's got the less attenuation correction applied to it. And what we you see in the middle panel is that the technologist has moved the uh, emission and transmission data to co-register on them better and you can see that the, that uh, abnormality magically disappears. The other thing you, can't, you have to watch out for is also that the, um, the technician can go too much the other way and you can get uh, uh, a septal abnormality occurring if they overcorrect for that. So misregistration is always important. It's always to, important to look at uh, the, the images for, uh, for uh, misregistration. The other uh, issue that uh, is not uncommon with uh, uh, PET-CT imaging is the effects of respiratory motion. These were a, a, slid of, a set of slides that uh, we made early on in our, uh, our PET experiences with PT. And you can see on the left-hand side, uh, this, the data was acquired, the attenuation map was acquired with free breathing. You can see that the diaphragm here on the right side is, is you know, captured at, at different times that, uh, depending on the, on the breathing. And this can cause problems, particularly along the inferior wall, particularly towards the apex. Uh, uh, it can cause uh, apparent abnormalities when there aren't any. The middle panel uh, was with the patients uh, where the attenuation map was, uh, was created uh, with uh, a breath hold and in, in inspiration. And it, you can see uh, something analogous to what we saw in the last slide where the antralateral part of the LV being outside the mediastinum. We uh, found that the breath hold on end expiration is the best way to uh, obtain an attenuation map. So that the last slide was respiratory motion. This is a study we acquired fairly recently. Um, and you can 
so that so just to familiar size, uh, familiarize you with the images. The top uh, row uh, uh, is uh, acquired at Strass. Corresponding uh, images um, are, are below, and then uh, the third and fourth are, are, are a continuation of that. And uh, you know, if you take this at face value, you could perhaps convince yourself that there's a fairly substantial reversible defect in the LED distribution, maybe an involvement of the inferior wall, and you could be um, uh, sending somebody to the cath lab that doesn't need to go to the cath lab because this is all related to motion. And, you know, if you look at the cavity, particularly on the stress images, you can see that the LB cavity is all stretched out. This is if somebody's pulled it, they're trying to pull it apart. And you can see that the, um, the, the, there's, there's not very good definition between the blood pool and the myocardium. These are kind of hallmarks of uh, patient motion. So uh, two, or three minutes, two or three hours after this, these images that were acquired, we had the patient come back down and uh, strict instructions uh, to the technologist and also to the patient that they needed to not be moving when their data was being acquired. And as you can see, a pretty much uh, normal looking scan, you could maybe think there might be a little perfusion abnormality and fairly at the apex. Again, that is probably just some misregistration between the CT and the emission data. So quality is, is very important with that and uh, is often uh, not so easy to detect with SPECT. You know, with SPECT, we look at the rotating images. There's software that we can use to correct for that. You really don't have that with PET, so you, you really have to uh, be careful about the quality of your uh, data. Dr. McGee, this is Kyle here. Um, just a few things. The audience is wondering if you can use uh, your pointer sometimes to point out some of the findings that you're discussing. And um, it's just intermittently choppy sometimes. And if you could figure out maybe to turn off the video to see if that might help. So I thought I had turned off the video. No, is that not the case? You're still showing up. Oh, really? I'm just not seeing myself, I guess. Um, I don't know how to turn off the- That's the, okay, we could probably keep going. All right, and then, uh, okay. Um, so uh, let's switch from the hardware to the isotopes. And uh, here you can see um, uh, water, uh, which is uh, probably the gold standard for, for, for PET imaging. Uh, it is a very uh, short half-life, it's not commercially available, but it, 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 it does give a very accurate uh, representation of blood flow. In the U.S., we are pretty much, uh, the, the two isotopes we currently use are N13 ammonia and rubidium-82, uh, and these are the flow characteristics. And you can see there is a significant drop-off as the, uh, you know, as the flow rates uh, get, get higher up into the I twos to three mLs per milligram per, per minute. Significantly better than the te technetium ones. Uh, thallium uh, would run somewhere in between the two, between uh, rubidium and ammonia, though we don't you know, use thallium pretty much anymore because of its unfavorable um, uh, dosimetry. So uh, we are left with uh, uh, rubidium and ammonia. Um, uh, with rubidium being the predominant isotope that's used for PET imaging. Um, the, it is a um, um, uh, potassium analog, so it's actively taken up across the cell membranes and in, in, into the myocardium. Um, this is something that got lost in translation from Mac to Windows. I apologize, it should be a beta. Uh, so its maximal beta energy is pretty high, so it's 3.35. So what does that mean? Well, uh, Positrons, um, when they come out of their, uh, have different energies. So rubidium, uh, the positron has got a high energy, so it tends to travel further within the, the tissue before it uh, collides with an electron and undergoes annihilation. 
compared to uh, ammonia, which uh, you can see the value is, is less. And, and how that affects image, uh, the, or why that matters, is you tend to get uh, uh, noisier, noisier images because of that, that uh, because of that larger distance between where the iso the positron is emitted before it annihilates. Uh, rubidium is a generator produced uh, radioisotope. Um, it's got a very short half-life of 76 seconds, which really means that the only form of stress that we can do with rubidium is with um, uh, pharmacologic stress. You can imagine if you try to exercise somebody on a treadmill, uh, time you got them dragged off the treadmill, positioned on the PET scanner, there wouldn't be anything left to, left to image. Ammonia on the other, uh, is, uh, is another isotope that is used for perfusion imaging. Uh, it's uh, both passive uptake, it's cationic, and it's also uh, taken up by the cells that is sodium potassium ATPase. It is uh, cyclotron uh, produced, but uh, you don't have to have an on-site cyclotron to use it. If you live within, say, 30 minutes or so of a, a commercial cyclotron, you, you can uh, use the... Um, the isotope. Uh, it's got a half-life of 10 minutes, but you can, you can time the doses uh, such that you might get delivered, uh, you know, 60 millicuries or so, uh, and then by the time you have to use it, it's at the right dose. So rubidium is uh, typically used for higher volume sites. You can pretty much do as many studies you want in a day with uh, rubidium. And in fact, you know, from an economic perspective, uh, that the, the more st studies you do, uh, the, uh, the more economically uh, viable it is. For lower volume sites, then uh, ammonia is a good way to go. If you're doing maybe two or three patients um, a day, two or three days per week, then that might be the better route to go. So a little bit more about rubidium. Uh, as I said, it's uh, generator produced. And you can see down here, um, the, the generator that gets uh, delivered by, you know, FedEx. Um, the, the, parent the, the parent isotope is strontium-82. It's got a half-life of 23 days. So these uh, generators will last four to six weeks, depending on the volume of patients or doses you use. Um, this uh, comes and it gets slotted in here into a shielded uh, automatic uh, infusion system. There is a uh, strontium column and it gets diluted with water and uh, normal saline and uh, rubidium uh, gets, gets diluted off of it. And you get um, a patient dose about once every 10 minutes, kind of depending on the age of the generator and uh, the, um, the uh, doses infused into the patient. Uh, these will typically you know, run I don't know the exact cost, but this one probably going to be about thirty thousand dollars, and they're you know they're going to, you're going to replace them once every four to six weeks. Here's a typical image protocol for uh, PET CT for us. Um, you can we start off here. Where we actually start with a topogram for uh, positioning. Uh, there we then perform a transmission CT scan. Uh, the type we used uh, is going to be dependent on uh, whether a patient has a prior history of coronary disease or not. If they do have a prior history of coronary disease and we're not interested in the calcium score, then we use a kind of dumbed down CT scan where it's not ECG gated. Uh, it's performed at end expiration as we talked about, uh, very low MAs um, and uh, low radiation exposure, about a quarter of a millisiever. If the patient's got uh, no known history of coronary disease, then we will typically uh, do a calcium scan because uh, we found the calcium scan is very, very useful, uh, both in uh, interpreting the study, but also uh, it, it's very helpful in patient management and risk stratification. Then the patient will be injected with the rest dose of uh, uh, rubidium and the emission scan will be acquired. The emission scans are all list mode. Uh, list mode. They're all gated to the ECG. The first, uh, from zero to 120 seconds, the data we use there is for our arterial input. It's kind of the you know the blood pool phase, and then the uh, the 
in 120 to 360 seconds. Uh, this more for uh, we are looking at the myocardial perfusion because the blood pool is gone, it's taken up from the myocardium. So if we do the rest scan, then we do pharmacologic stress. The vast majority done with the regadenosine. Uh, we do do some diaphragmal adenosine and also the BDE. Um, the image. Uh, Image is actually acquired during stress, so we're getting true stress perfusion and as well as true stress, uh, stress function. Most of the time we will do a stress transmission CT scan um, uh, at the end. And uh, so that's, uh, um, that's our protocol. And uh, it's, uh, We can, you know, you can fairly comfortably, uh, you know, have this all accomplished within 35 minutes. So really fast turn, fast turnaround. You get the rest and stress pictures within a short period of time. You know, having to wait uh, for a few hours to do the the, the rest and then the stress um, is uh, very uh, convenient for inpatients. You really fast turnaround and uh, get them out of the hospital if it's normal or proceed with the heart cath or whatever it is abnormal. Dr. Bateman is going to be talking mainly about uh, myocardial flow. Um, I'm just going to talk briefly about uh, how it, this is acquired. Two key measurements are for calculating myocardial blood flow is we need to know what the arterial concentration is and what the myocardial uptake is. Um, we uh, use a region of interest located in the left atrium. Uh, it measures five centimeters by five centimeters by five centimeters. And as I mentioned earlier, this data is, is um, acquired in the first 120 seconds of the dynamic listen one activation. Then as the, the blood pool uh, washes away, uh, we uh, can define the myocardial uh, boundaries uh, using automated edge detection and uh, we can uh, uh, measure uh, myocardial uptake and in integrate that with arterial flow, which allows us to calculate coronary flows. And we, uh, this is kind of uh, the data that we get. Um, uh, you can see the curves here down below and the flows at rest and the stress and the ratio, but more to come on this later. Um, so, at the advantage of PET uh, perfusion imaging, uh, you get very high quality images with excellent uh, diagnostic accuracy. Um, typically with SPECT, you're going to have the slice thickness and spatial resolution is going to be between 7 to 8 millimeters. Um, with uh, the more, you know, the, the, the latest uh, PET scanners, that's down to two millimeters. The, uh, the, the digital uh, PET scanners are about two millimeters. The analogs are somewhere between four to six. Um, and uh, you, you really get these high quality images that you're going to see shortly. Very short acquisition times, little fast fruit, uh, throughput, um, very little radiation exposure. Um, I think uh, Dr. Thompson talked about this earlier uh, in the course last week, we're talking about two to three millisievers uh, for, for PET scan. With rubidium, uh, as we're acquiring data during a stress, then we have an ejection fraction at rest and also a peak stress, uh, which is important uh, prognostically to see the ejection fraction going up. If we see the EF going down, then uh, that is uh, uh, of adverse prognostic factor. We're able to quantitate absolute blood flow at rest and peak stress, um, which uh, we're going to hear about more about shortly. And as these PET scanners are pretty much uh, all now PET CT, we also do uh, coronary artery calcium scans at the same time. Here is a uh, images from our PET CT, our new PET CT scanner, our digital scanner. Um, and you can see here, uh, we have the uh, slight uh, rows one. And so here we have the stress images, the corresponding resting images. And uh, you can see, you're even seeing papillary muscles. You can see here, as we come out to the base, we're starting to see the 
atria. These are only half the slices. We're skipping slices here, so we're getting uh, so you know we're getting somewhere in the region of uh, 48 slices. You know, with a spec scanner, you'd be likely uh, lucky to get uh, eight to ten slices. Here's the vertical long axis slices and the horizontal slices. This is uh, data from uh, Ottawa, from uh, Dr. Beanland's lab, uh, just uh, looking at diagnostic accuracy between PAT and SPAC. Uh, you can see the pooled sensitivity for PAT is around 90%. This corresponding data for SPAC is around uh, 78%. And the specificity is around 87% uh, versus 70% for SPAC. Um, Dr. Bain will talk more about flows here, but just really to show that if you've uh, yeah, normal uh, flow reserve, uh, you've got a very, very good prognosis versus somebody who's got a very low flow reserve. These are adjusted for risk, uh, clinical risk factors, ejection fraction, uh, EF, BF reserve, and uh, perfusion defect size. And uh, we talked a little bit about the importance of the EF uh, rest and stress and looking for the reserve. And again, you can see that the patients <coughs> who uh, don't have uh, any uh, reserve have got a much higher event rate and all cause uh, mortality. So uh, I think this is my last slide. So uh, this is a statement that uh, was actually co authored by uh, Dr. Bateman in 2016. Uh, from ASNIC and the SNMMI. Uh, PET MPI indications preferred is first line preferred test for all patients with an appropriate indication for MPI requiring pharmacologic stress. Um, it's recommended for people with uh, prior testing with poor quality, equivocal, or inconclusive results. Uh, body characteristics, unfavorable body characteristics such as high BMI, large breasts, predominant abdomen. High risk patients, patients with complex coronary disease, chronic kidney disease, type 2 diabetes. Younger patients with coronary disease uh, is uh, preferred or recommended just because you're going to, these patients might be having repeated uh, radiologic procedures, whether it be nuclear procedures or cor coronary, uh, coronary angiograms, uh, it helps to lower the uh, radiation exposure over the, the time, the, the life of that patient. And uh, as we're going to hear about now, uh, it allows us to quantitate uh, myocardial blood flow. Thank you. And Dr. McGee, while we're switching over, uh, just a couple questions that came in when you were talking about the motion um, artifacts. Uh, if you could talk a little bit about your quality control for the patient motion and then in your example, with the different motion artifacts, would you need to repeat the entire rest and stress portion or just the portion that was affected? So, uh, uh, yeah, it kind of depends on the software you have uh, for interpreting your pet, your pet images uh, for looking for uh, motion. It, you know, it, it's not like spec where you can just rotate the images around and look for motion. Um, you really have to, um, you, the, you know the main tip. The main tip off is uh, is it looking at the quality of the images. Is the the, the LV uh, shape? Is it uh, is it misformed? Is are the images look kind of ragged looking? Uh, ragged looking. Uh, the uh, software that we have um, with Imaging Pro, uh, it, we uh, there are quality indicators that are gonna are gonna. Uh, tell us uh, if there is motion there or not, um, but that's not widely available. Um, if you see that the rest images look okay, and it's just really the stress that's the problem, then you, you can just do the stress again. You don't need to do, do the whole thing. Oftentimes it is the, the stress images that you have the main problem with motion uh, because uh, the patients are uncomfortable with the, you know, the regadenosin or the diperidamol or, or, or denosin, you know, they, they feel uncomfortable or whatever. And so that's, ten, that's oftentimes when they, they tend to move about. Um, so I, does that answer the question? 
Great, I thank you. Uh, are my slides up? Yes, we can, we can see them. Okay, good. All right, so we're gonna switch gears here and we're gonna talk about uh, blood flow and flow reserve um, from uh, different perspectives. And uh, so I'm gonna start with a case, okay? So this is a 73 year old man. Uh, he's complaining about periodic chest pains and exertional dyspnea, multiple risk factors, left ventricular hypertrophy, and he's referred for a regadenosine rubidium PET MPI. So here are the uh, images. This is actually off of a uh, PET 16. Okay. It's, it's not full slide. It's, Oh, um, Ian says it's not full full page. So I'll. I, I think I think we're able to see full page. Yes, are you able to see full page? Okay, all right. So so here are the images, and so here's the question. Okay, and it's a bit of a trick question, so be careful. Okay, so this perfusion PET study is most consistent with what? Normal coronary arteries, moderate multivessel disease, 50% left main disease, or microvascular disease. And I can't see what numbers are coming in, so Kyle or yes. I can let you know most there's a, a little bit of a split between four and one. Between four and one. Okay. Well, that's good. I'm, I'm glad that there's a split because there is a reality here. The reality is that when we see a normal myocardial perfusion image study like this, it could indicate normal coronaries. It, there could be lots of hidden disease here, balance 75% three vessel disease. There could be 50% left main disease. There could be severe microvascular disease and the patient might not have even responded to the vasodilator stress. I mean, that's the reality of spatially relative myocardial perfusion imaging. Uh, and it's a, it's a much bigger problem as you can imagine with um, pharmacologic stress than it is with exercise. We have, we have other parameters to look at with exercise stress like duration and chest pain and ST changes and arrhythmias. But, you know, with pharmacologic stress, it really comes down to the images. And uh, unless you have some other uh, tools in your box, uh, you can be missing a lot of things. I remember a, uh, a retreat the nuclear cardiology community had several years ago and when we started to do coronary calcium screening in conjunction with myocardial perfusion imaging. And oh my gosh, even just cases like this were, were eye-opening to us. What we used to say was, uh, you, know, uh, no, you know, no underlying coronary disease or low likelihood for significant coronary disease or low likelihood for uh, cardiac events, you know, the, 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 that was a misbelief. And it was, it was obvious when we uh, look, start to look a little bit deeper into what other things might be going on uh, behind an apparently normal uh, myocardial perfusion study. So um, here's a normal, and we've already talked about that, okay? So we could be missing a lot with this normal vasodilator study. And here's a patient who has a severe abnormality inferiorly and infraroceptally, extends from the apex to the base of the heart. It's probably in the distribution of the right coronary artery. But what about these other areas that look so much better than that terrible area inferiorly and infraroceptally? Are these really normal? or are they just substantially better perfused than what we're seeing in Fairly? This is probably a, a CTO or almost a CTO. It's a very severe reversible defect, but this may be three vessel disease or it may be single vessel disease. And we don't know 
by looking at a spatially relative study uh, what we are dealing with. And then we come to even a, a more interesting uh, scenario. So here's a mild reversible defect laterally. Is this ischemia? I mean, we glibly call it ischemia, but is it really ischemia? Or is this just a spatially relative perfusion defect? We learned years ago that you don't have to have very much difference between vascular territories in order to see a reversible perfusion defect. So in this case, if we had the anterior and inferior walls uh, augmenting to three times baseline flows and the lateral wall augmenting to 2.5 times baseline flows, we're talking about a spatially relative perfusion defect. We're not talking about ischemia. There's a big difference between ischemia and a spatially relative perfusion defect. And uh, I think the ischemia trial points that out very nicely. And it is time that we move on uh, and from the whole concept of spatial relativity and start talking about the difference between true ischemia, which is concerning, and a spatially relative perfusion defect. So progressing beyond that era, interesting, right? So what's vision all about is recognizing the need for change. In this case, the problem of underestimating uh, disease extent and what the ramifications are. Leadership, which is paving the way towards change. And that's what ASNIC and SNMMI have been doing recently in emphasizing the value of, of PET. And real change, of course, depends on all of us individually in the practicing community. Are we gonna get on the, on the train and uh, start moving this field where it ought to be now that we know the power that, uh, that we can have with this new technology. Now, I know a lot of people listening here are much younger than me. There's probably five people older than me on here. But I remember the days when we didn't have myocardial perfusion imaging and we had to make decisions based on talking to people and what happened to them on the treadmill test. The nuclear field has been so important and yet so slow to adopt new technology. So the treadmill was the gateway to the catheterization laboratory for almost two decades. And gosh, you know, back in those days, nobody wanted to be in the cath lab. We needed technologies to help to avoid it. This is the dreaded clamp that would be on somebody's groin for three to four hours after uh, coronary angiography uh, back when I was training as many of you folks are. This is the first um, myocardial perfusion study to demonstrate uh, or to help diagnose coronary disease. It was done with a rectilinear scanner uh, and these were manually uh, movable. Uh, you can see that at stress, there, you can identify that there is reduced perfusion uh, compared to at rest. So it did the trick. But uh, there were many of these scanners across the country uh, that were doing general nuclear medicine and now uh, might be able to do some cardiac imaging. So Barry Zaret published this in the New England Journal in 1973. He talked about, uh, you know, uh, it, it offers promise as a broad screening method. It provides a, as well a means of assessing the effects of both surgical and pharmacologic modes of therapy uh, and so forth. But the interesting thing was in, this is 1973, in 1956, this man, L. Anger, had already invented the Anger camera, which took decades to uh, replace the rectilinear camera. The images are obviously much 
better than what could be attained with the rectilinear scanner. Uh, this is just showing how we dealt with attenuation artifacts in those days. We would, we, we would lift the uh, lady's breasts up and we would tape them and we would put a metal uh, rod or flexible metal rod to show where the bottom of the breast was uh, to try to make uh, uh, correct diagnoses. And this actually revolutionized the care of coronary patients. In those eras, it had what we called high diagnostic accuracy, good risk stratification, was inexpensive, and, and so forth. Uh, by 1987, it was evident there was a huge clinical need for perfusion imaging. Uh, about 30% of every publication in the cardiac literature focused on nuclear cardiology. Uh, expertise was widely sought. Cardiology practices were expanding and heart institutes we're starting to appear. Now, why am I saying all this stuff? I'm saying all this stuff because SPECT imaging was introduced at about that time, and it obviously is much better than planar. It's obvious just looking at these images. The interventional colleagues grasped onto this immediately and wanted this instead of planar imaging. Uh, even before there was reimbursement for SPECT imaging, it became common in, uh, in practice settings. Uh, in a bow to those people that did not want to move forward with the introduction of new technology, for years we did a combination of planar and SPECT. In fact, that's the only way that we could get paid uh, for this technology. Uh, and you can kind of see how uh, volumes shot up dramatically uh, during those years. But in order to bring sanity to all this, it, there was a need for a so society, ASNIC, and this is its first board of directors, and you can recognize some of these uh, folks. Uh, but, you know, the interesting thing is that there was great hesitation in adopting change from planar to spec. And uh, we're seeing kind of the same thing today in terms of the adoption of PET, which is obviously a great step forward uh, compared to traditional SPECT. And uh, it, uh, it, it is, it's the purpose of uh, what you've been hearing for the last two weeks uh, to kind of uh, wake up a little bit and recognize that this is the way forward. I, I don't have a question here, but I just thought I would, would ask it and somebody can tell me. I think there's about 250 people on here. Can I just kind of, everybody just vote. How many of you have access to Cardiac Pet at your programs? It looks like it's almost going to be even yes and no. Is that right? About 50-50, huh? Yeah. So, um, so there's, there's a need for exposure for, for you all. I mean, those of us who are working with PET um, can't imagine not having PET for myocardial perfusion imaging, never mind for cardiac inflammatory diseases like, like sarcoidosis. Uh, for device infections, for vasculitides, uh, for prosthetic valve endocarditis, and, uh, and so forth. So there's a great uh, paper out, Clinical Quantification of Myocardial Blood Flow Using PET, uh, uh, from uh, jointly between uh, ASNIC and SNMMI. You should have a look at this. It's, it's very detailed. It's very contemporary. Uh, it is the, the go-to uh, paper at this point in time. Uh, we are coming out very shortly with another paper on myocardial blood flow quantification. Um, and this is a simplified, in, simplified instruction for the community practitioner. You know, blood flow quantification has been around since the 1980s, but has predominantly been hidden away in academic centers for, uh, for research on coronary physiology. It's only in the last um, uh, 10 years or so that it has transitioned into the community. 
but there needs to be uh, more granular instruction, practical instruction, where you don't have uh, a deep resource about how to perform it, quality control it, interpret it, and uh, report it. So here's another question. Measurement of myocardial blood flow requires a PET CT camera, a higher dosage of tracer, a longer acquisition research. Kyle, can you give me some guidance? What numbers yep. are coming up? The most, most everybody is choosing option one. Okay. So actually, that's not true. Act, actually, um, you can measure blood flow uh, probably as well on a dedicated camera as you can on a PET CT camera. In fact, a lot of the validation work uh, way back in time was done on dedicated uh, PET cameras. In the US today, there are probably about 150 sites doing uh, regular acquisition of um, blood flow and about half are being done on dedicated cameras. You don't need a higher dosage of tracer. Uh, it doesn't impact throughput efficiency. Uh, you don't have to have an interest in research for this to be very useful uh, to you in clinical decision making. Uh, as Ian mentioned, you start the acquisition a little bit earlier. So the patient's not on the table any longer. It's just that instead of, of starting your image a couple of minutes after you inject the tracer, you start your image acquisition uh, the instant that you, uh, uh, that you start the uh, tracer to be infused. So it's a little bit longer actual acquisition. So again, kind of a tricky question. So it's a unique capability of PET, uh, a very exciting advancement. It's transitioned to important clinical usefulness. It's able to be done routinely. It can be measured in principle on all PET and PET CT cameras and, ex and except on very old cameras, there's no extra radiation and there's no additional acquisition uh, impact on acquisition time. So what do we do? Well, we measure in absolute terms in ML per minute per gram of myocardium, uh, blood flow at rest and at the peak of stress. For the most part, uh, yes, we can look at these things and we do, and we will talk about that. But for the most part, for clinical decision-making, we predominantly look at flow reserve, which is expressed as a ratio of peak stress over rest flow. And as Ian and others have said over the last couple of weeks, normal blood flow reserve, um, it, very rarely are you going to find in a prognostically important coronary disease when uh, patients can increase blood flow more than two times. Uh, if they can increase blood flow more than two times everywhere, uh, very, very low likelihood of uh, any significant problems with uh, uh, coronary physiology. Um, you, obviously, if you can increase blood flow uh, more than two times globally, uh, the fact that you might have a small area that's less than that would indicate a problem, but uh, the prognosis is still very good if globally blood flows go up more than two times. In fact, global blood flow reserve correlates, uh, greater than two correlates with low risk for major events in an array of populations. Obviously, there needs to be much, much more literature, uh, but uh, it, there's ex extensive enough studies uh, so far that we know the power of being able to augment blood flow more than double what it is at rest. So, um, you know, this is a physiological measurement, okay? there's going to be variability. Um, blood flow is, is determined, at least at rest, it's determined uh, by uh, those things that uh, determine oxygen consumption or myocardial work. 
So as you know, the double product, systolic blood pressure and uh, heart rate are the major determinants of cardiac work. And those things vary according to lots of things in life, right? I mean, are you under stress? You know, uh, are you dehydrated? Um, you know, what are you anticipating today in your work life, et cetera, et cetera? So there is a physiological um, variability in what these flow measurements are going to be. You would not expect, just you wouldn't expect the exact same heart rate on day one and day two, or the same systolic blood pressure on day one or day two. You wouldn't expect the same flows and therefore the same flow reserves necessarily on day one or day two. That's physiology. So we have to factor that into how we're going to look at these measurements and how they're gonna help us make decisions. There can also be variability, however, if we don't take care with the technical aspects of, of measuring blood flow. Okay, so, so these are some of the important principles that, that we need to think about because we wanna take the variability from the technical standpoint out of the, uh, out of the mix here. So we need a good free running intravenous, right? We, we, we need the stressor, we need it to, uh, to, to do its work effectively and we need the tracer to, to get to its target properly and not get held up somewhere. So we need a good free running IV. So an 18 gauge, at least a 21 gauge, uh, and not a tiny hand vein, but uh, an anti, optimally an anti-cubital vein. Uh, we want to get uh, we want to get consistent measurements so that we learn our equipment and our software and the numbers that derive from it. So we have to decide if we're going to flush or we're not going to flush. But you know, whatever you're going to do, do it the same all the time. So you don't have to deal with variability. All of the stressors that we use augment blood flow differently. They augment blood flow to a different degree and they augment blood flow uh, to its max at different time intervals after the tracer is either infused or injected. So um, it will be difficult if you use diperidomol on some patients and regadenosin on other patients for you to get calibrated as to what is a good healthy blood flow in, uh, in your lab. So it's best to use uh, uh, one of these and stick with it. You, because the time to peak blood flow is, is, uh, uh, is, is we haven't precisely identified that, but we know that it differs with time after you inject, for example, regadenosin. So if you inject regadenosin at time zero and you start your tracer injection or infusion in 10 seconds or 30 seconds or 60 seconds or 90 seconds or 120 seconds, you're going to get a different flow uh, augmentation. So uh, without knowing for sure exactly what's right, you know, you just want to be sure that you are, are doing your measurement at uh, the same time, all of the time. We use a stopwatch in our lab. Uh, we measure it at two minutes after uh, regadenosin. Very, uh, very important uh, concept take off that technical variability in this measurement. And as Ian mentioned, you need to start the acquisition before the tracer arrives at uh, what, wherever you're gonna place your input region of interest. So um, what we want to do is, is we want to measure a blood flow uh, to all areas of the heart. We wanna measure it in areas of uh, uh, throughout the myocardium at rest, and then uh, at uh, areas of perfusion defect, as well as areas where there is apparent normality. Okay. We can depict that in many different ways. So in this case, you can see that uh, 
what the blood flow is at what the relative distribution of blood flow is at rest. You can see that at stress, you know, this area that corresponds to the uh, defect is much, much lower. And you can see it's actually black in the reserve map, which means that it's actually gone down below what it was at rest. Okay, so we call that myocardial steel. Okay, flow actually went down lower at rest than what it was at stress. Um, and that only happens with very, very high grade stenosis. Now, we can also quantify that into a 17 segment model, and we can measure blood flow at rest and at the peak of stress and the reserve in uh, each of those myocardial segments. We can then average them into presumed coronary territories, which is what we always do. So in this case, the flow reserve was 1.4 for the RCA, for the entire RCA, although we're seeing that portions of it here actually went below zero, uh, below one. Uh, globally, it was 2.29. The other important thing to remember is that we really are are measuring the quantification of the uh, tracer before it enters the coronary circulation and its uptake into the myocardium. So we're measuring, we're, we're, we're assessing blood flow through the epicardial coronary arteries as well as the microvasculature. There are different models out there. Uh, I, I'm, I'm going to minimize the importance of this because there's never been anything to say that one is better than another. They're, they're different. Uh, they'll give you slightly different measurements at rest and at the peak of stress, but the ratio or the reserve uh, tracks pretty well between net retention, what's called dynamic re net retention and compartmental modeling. The retention models are older and simpler. They work just fine in the clinical setting to answer clinical questions. Uh, uh, as you move in this direction, uh, they become newer, they become more complex, they become more precise. So if you're a clinician, this will work just fine. If you're in an academic center and, and you want precision for, for some reason, or you want to be able to, uh, uh, to be using software that's precise enough that you can do a multi-center study, uh, you might want, you, you would move more towards compartmental modeling. So different flow models are available. They rely on different assumptions. Uh, you got to know your software and uh, process according to its specifications. So, uh, so this kind of says, what are the important things? Well, you have to define uh, you have to define a region of interest for the arterial input function. So it might be in the left atrium, it might be in the left ventricle. Obviously, the left atrium is a little bit simpler to identify because it's a bigger, thin-walled structure. It's relatively easy to put a region of interest in the middle of it and uh, let and and be able to track it uh, throughout the. Uh, the tracer flowing through the heart. If you put it in the left ventricle, you have to deal with other things, uh, such although it's closer to the to the coronary arteries origins, uh, you have got other problems with myocardial walls uh, impacting it, as well as uh, torsion of the left ventricle and during the cardiac cycle and so forth. You have to have precise detection of the myocardial boundary, okay? You don't want it going off into adjacent structures. Um, you have to uh, begin the acquisition before the tracer arrives at the region of interest for the input function, okay? You always should see something like this. And you do have to inspect the uh, uptake curves uh, that should look similar to what uh, we're looking at here. Uh, you can't just look at the numbers, okay? Very important. That's, it's just like with SPECT. You've got the physician reading the study has got to have some quality control tools to bring confidence 
the numbers will always come out. Uh, but look what's happened here is, you know, the tracer starts to go in at stress and then there's a big drop and then it goes in again. Uh, and likewise, even at rest, we're seeing that. So obviously there's a very poor injection going on here. Maybe there's some obstruction, maybe the patient has moved. But when you see this sort of thing, you, you can't accept uh, these numbers. This is erroneous and uh, cannot be reported on. Uh, just like FFRs and things like that, um, you know, it's one GANS catheters, you know, um, uh, very important that you look at the rest numbers. The rest numbers have to make sense because you're really looking at, at the rest compared to stress and expressing that as a ratio. So the rest numbers have to be reasonable. And one way that you can determine whether they're reasonable or not is that you can look at what is the rate pressure product. So we measure the uh, heart rate and the blood pressure, okay? while the patient's lying under the camera before you start the study. And um, these are the determinants of, of, of blood flow. And uh, this is an old study, but it, it shows this uh, linear relationship at rest. Obviously with stress, people are going to vary, but at rest, it follows along a, a pretty straight line. Uh, in our validation studies, um, the, um, if we multiply the rest heart rate by the systolic blood pressure, uh, 9,700 turned out to be the magic number. Uh, if you multiply those two, divide it by 9,700, you'd come out with 0.5, which is about what the regional and global flow is. Give you a, a higher double product and higher flows at rest. The way we do this, and you, you, you get it gets pretty good, is is uh, I, I just round this stuff off. Fifty times a hundred, okay, that's five thousand. Divide by ten thousand, okay, it should be around 0.5. And you get you get to the point where you do that uh, very quickly, and it's kind of a litmus test. Um, if I find these numbers way off, I'm thinking that there is a major problem with the base measurement. Likewise, when the- just, just a quick question, the 9,700, where did that value come from? That came from a series of several thousand uh, patients uh, that we looked at for what the resting flows were in relationship to the double product. Um, the, um, the other thing to look at is that when the rest images look normal, flows sh should, I mean, if you thought about it, flows should be about the same everywhere. Uh, there's only a few cardiac conditions where flows should be uh, highly variable at rest, right? Uh, in somebody that hasn't had an infarct or doesn't have evident scar, you know, and you, you know what those conditions are. I mean, uh, you know, things like asymmetric septal hypertrophy, apical hypertrophy, perhaps severe aortic stenosis where the left, uh, you know, portions of the left ventricle are under greater tensile uh, pressure than uh, maybe the inferior wall or the right coronary circulation. But when you see things like this, you know, big differences, look at the flow at rest is so much higher in this territory than everywhere else. That's almost certainly misregistration artifact. And uh, the, it, the images just got to go back and get reprocessed on the camera and brought back for, uh, for, uh, Remeasurement. So I I find this algorithm kind of uh, kind of helpful uh, for potential disease states. Uh, when you think about this, normal coronaries, normal microvasculature, uh, both abnormal or one abnormal and the other normal. You can usually sort this out and it and figure things things out. You know, you've seen this these diagrams normal epicardium, normal microvasculature, abnormal epicardium, normal microvasculature, isolated um, coronary microvascular disease, and, um, and both abnormal. And you can correlate these generally with FFR. It's not perfect. Uh, we're gradually 
uh, learning the situations where they do correlate very well and where patients will probably be benefited by an interventional and, um, and where patients may not benefit because their FFR is only mildly reduced, but their coronary flow reserve is horribly reduced. You know, what's the point of fixing the epicardium if, uh, if there's so much downstream disease that people can't augment blood flow uh, anyway? So Ian went over this. I'm not going to uh, say any more about this. We'll look at cases in just a minute. So, but no known coronary disease uh, when left main or multivessel disease is expected, when microvascular dysfunction is suspected, heart transplant patients, ED, hospitalized patients, uh, myocardial blood flow reserve, very, very powerful and very, uh, very helpful. Some people probably aren't gonna benefit as much, you know, um, these are categories of patients where, I mean, they're already at very, very high risk. And uh, in some cases, it'll be helpful, but in other cases, uh, maybe not so much. The most common scenarios when it's helpful is to be confirmatory of perfusion assessment. When it's majorly discrepant, and that's when you have to go back to your quality control and be sure it's right, to rule in or rule out multivessel disease in cases where there's a single perfusion defect, to be confident the vasodilator was effective, or to diagnose um, microvascular disease. We, we kind of follow something like this in terms of, of blood flow reserve prognostically greater than two, whether or not there's a perfusion defect, the risk is, is low, 1.8 to two. If there is a perfusion defect, uh, risk a bit higher. If there is no perfusion defect, depending on the, pop, on the patient you're looking at, an older person, perhaps uh, the risk is still low. When you get down into these types of numbers, whether there's a perfusion defect or not, you're dealing with uh, higher degrees of risk. Obviously, when there's minimal, uh, kind of down in the noise level, if there's a perfusion defect, this is the highest risk. And at some point, if there's no perfusion defect and very minimal flow reserve, if any, you have to suspect that the tracer, that, that the stress agent didn't work. I'm, I'm going to just show one more or a couple more slides here from Krishna's work. Um, very important work. It, it, some of this work is confirmatory of what others have done and some adds to it. Uh, this shows that the amount of ischemia present uh, has an bearing on all-cause mortality. But when you add flow reserve to no ischemia or to 1 to 10 percent ischemia or greater than 10 percent spatially relative perfusion defect, I guess I should say, not truly ischemia, you can see the impact of myocardial blood flow reserve on uh, outcomes starting actually very early uh, after the uh, test is performed. And uh, her study shows that, that th there is added benefit of knowing blood flow reserve in terms of the benefit of uh, revascularization or, or when the patient is more likely to benefit from revascularization, even after knowing how much ischemia or scar is present and a number of other uh, factors. So when you get down around 1.7, 1.8, and below um, the uh, benefit of an intervention becomes more evident compared to ongoing medical therapy. So we're gonna, I'm gonna stop there so that we have time to go on to some cases. Uh, and if, if and there Dr. Are, Bateman, there were a few questions that came in okay. to talk to. Sure. Um, one of the questions was, um, do we need the time of flight imaging principles in PET CT in order to acquire the MFR? No, you do, you do not. Actually, time of flight has become uh, you know, fairly important for oncologic uh, purposes where you need some degree of precision uh, for localization of uh, uh, areas of uh, uptake. Um, 
and being able to uh, superimpose them on anatomic structures from CT. Uh, there, there's, there is some work in the literature comparing time of flight for cardiac purposes uh, that, that would, that's suggestive that it might uh, represent some improvement. Uh, but um, but uh, certainly, you know, we've got time of flight on three of our machines now, and uh, I've, uh, I've not noticed a whole lot of difference. Okay, and then what values are we typically using for normal for the resting flow data? Well, as I mentioned, uh, you know, the, the resting flows are going to fluctuate in accordance with the double product. So um, uh, what, what, we would, what we normally would see is somewhere between about 0.4 and about 1.1 to 1.2. Transplant patients with higher heart rates, higher blood pressure, you know, are up at the higher end. Uh, athletes obviously are going to be at the lower end. Um, you, you do need a certain amount of blood flow even at rest to sustain myocardium. And uh, you know, if you get down into the 0 0.25, 0 0.28 type range, you, basically that scar tissue that, uh, that we're looking at uh, at those levels of resting flows. And another quick question that um, wonder what your thoughts were on the traditional teaching that when we think of epicardial disease, there's also usually some micro micro circulation disease or what your thoughts are on that based on these flow. Yeah, I think, I think we've, I think we've learned that uh, in the typical pet population, which tends to be older than what we have in spec lab, uh, you know, these, these people, um, so they're, they're older, they usually are symptomatic. Uh, they have the kinds of comorbidities in America that older people have, like, like hypertension and type two diabetes, um, some diastolic uh, type issues and, and so forth. And uh, very often, uh, even with completely normal studies, uh, we see uh, flow flows and flow reserves that are beginning to decline with uh, with age. Um, uh, uh, so we we tend to look at a collage of things, and that's what we're going to look at now. We're going to look at case reports, and we're going to see how we put all this stuff together about about um, appearances of the images at rest and stress, the changes in ventricular function between rest and stress, uh, the um, blood flow reserve globally and for different territories and for different segments, uh, the coronary artery calcium scores, you know, all these things. Uh, uh, it's nice if they all point together and sometimes they do uh, and sometimes they don't. I'm just gonna go through this one myself uh, so that you can see what we look for. Okay, so we have multiple slices. They're three millimeter thick. They're immediately adjacent to one another. There's no spaces in between them. Uh, stress and matching images at rest, uh, all the way from the apex. And then we have the vertical and horizontal long axis images here. I think everybody would agree that this is normal from a spatially relative perspective. You can see the quantification. Uh, is uh, is normal, okay? Um, sorry. Well, that's interesting. All right, so I'm snafu'd here. Uh, but anyway, there's the uh, rest images, and here are, I mean, the uh, perfusion images, and here are the gated images. We tend to, to look at these in grayscale. 
okay? And then we uh, look at them in thermal. We're looking for evidence of brightening around the myocardium. You see how it brightens and therefore it's thickening during the cardiac cycle. You can see the ejection fraction goes from 71 to 75%. It should, it should augment uh, with, uh, with PET when we're imaging at the peak of stress. It, um, if it goes down, that is bad. It's always bad if it goes down. Just because it goes up, I mean, that's nice. That's what we like to see. But it can also go up even when there is trouble afoot. Okay, because these vasodilators that we use for stress do other things than activate A2As. You're aware that heart rate goes up and blood pressure goes down in many patients. And obviously, um, you can have uh, problems with a patient. You can have a perfusion defect and so forth. Because of, um, of, of that problem. Um, in this case, uh, and I can't unfortunately bring up the, um, the actual working uh, model, uh, but in this case, uh, we have the blood flow augmentation, which, which uh, is not, uh, in this case, is not great. It's reduced uh, to 1.8 times baseline flows. Uh, but we have that. And uh, I, what I wanted to show you was, was how we put this all together from a quality control standpoint, but the software is telling me that I, that I can't load it. So I just wanted you to show, to, to show that one uh, normal case. And now we're going to show some more interesting uh, case for uh, somebody to uh, interpret. And we can take volunteers too. Yeah. Um, sure. Well, that's well, that's getting pulled up. Another question that came up: um, Can 18F fluoroperidase uh, be used for perfusion and flow reserve? You know, I I I, I suppose it probably could be. You know, obviously, uh, uh, I'm sorry, fluoroperidase. Did you say? Or did you yes. say FDG? Yes. Yes. Oh, fluoroperidase. Yeah, for sure. Absolutely. Yes. It, yes, it can. Um, the, um, there, there are going to be some papers coming out this year based on the uh, uh, subgroups that were tested in the first phase three study. Uh, the, uh, the images have been distributed around the country to different research labs, and they've been working at the flow quantification. Uh, it's, it's a little bit different model uh, with fluoropyridase than it is with uh, rubidium or ammonia. Uh, because FDG or, or, or sorry, fluor, uh, fluorination, the fluorinated uh, uh, component has a long half-life to it. So you've got background accounts that have to be accounted for when you do a rest-stress uh, type study. Okay, who wants to take a crack at, uh, at this study? Please raise your hand, whoever is interested. Raise your hand in the bottom. Maybe while we wait for volunteers, I can help you out with the first one. Okay, good. Um, so stress images are on the top, uh, rest are on the second row. Um, it looks like going from apex up to the base, there's a significant uh, reversible defect in the inferior, inferior lateral territory. Um, and it looks like there's also uh, TID as well present there. I'd be worried about, um, you know, with the TID potentially multivessel disease and in, in the inferior wall, especially including the RCA territory. Yeah. So, uh, so you're thinking multivessel disease. From the standpoint of spatial relativity, 
I guess you're thinking that for sure you've got circumflex disease and you're suspicious, I guess, of the right coronary maybe. Yep. Right. And you're right, there's uh, transient ischemic dilation. So that's nice things. It makes it a little bit easy when things are pointing in the same direction. Uh, not surprisingly, we're seeing a substantial drop in ejection fraction. We're also seeing that these affected areas are not thickening anymore. So what does that tell you? That we're dealing with. Is it high, right? High, 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 yeah. Right. right. Yeah. High grade, high grade lesions here that uh, are impacting on. So this is true ischemia, isn't it? This is not a. Yep. Ischemia. I don't know how many patients in the ischemia trial had on on the subgroup that got stress uh, imaging. I don't know how many of them had just a spatially relative perfusion defect and how many really had ischemia. I suspect the ones like this just didn't get enrolled in the study, you know, because there's there are too many high risk markers here. Uh, when we look at the um, quantification here, uh, this is just the, uh, this is the quality control uh, screens that, uh, that we use. Um, and uh, here are the uh, here are, is the flow information. So again, you can see the resting flows at rest. They're pretty well balanced, as you would expect, because the rest images look normal, okay, and they look fairly similar. There's not big changes in regional territory. 0.52. When you look at the augmentation, uh, it's horrible in the area of abnormality. And it actually goes, uh, uh, it, it, there's a steel phenomena in that area. Uh, it targets particularly the circumflex and the RCA, not so much the uh, LED territory. I think we can look at, um, I think we can look at segmental scores here too. And you can see, that they, uh, in portions here, it actually went below one, okay? Confirming the presence of, uh, of myocardial steel and uh, over here kind of just at, at one. Okay, so, so this is an 84 year old man, no known coronary disease being followed by cardiology for diabetes, hypertension, Claudication, dyslipidemia. He's a prior smoker. He came in earlier than he was scheduled. His habit is walking on the treadmill for 30 minutes daily at just two miles an hour. A week earlier, he had chest burning on the treadmill, needed to stop. Same thing the next day. He was prescribed in Inver and has had no further chest pain, but the MPI was ordered. So what do you what what do you think should be done with this man? I think given his symptoms and the findings here, he needs to go to the cath lab. Yeah. Does he need to go right now in the in the in the height of COVID? Or do you think he can wait for a month? I think that these are, are pretty high risk findings, um, and especially what we were talking about with the global reserve being less than two kind of in that. That's yeah. I think he should probably go sooner. Yeah. His coronary artery calcium score was 3,247. So you're not swayed by the fact that uh, he got put on to IMDR and he's now pain-free? <laughs> no, I, I think he should still probably go. I think these are high enough risks. Okay. Okay.
All right, anybody want to read this one? Any volunteers? All right, we have a volunteer, Rana. Okay. Hi, this is Rana from Lee, Boston. Okay. So, looking at the resting images um, from base going towards the apex and get go. So, I do see a reversible perfusion defect. Um, from at the mid to basal segments of the inferior and infralateral region, which is reversible. I'll grade it moderate. It's it's, it's good size. And then um, as you go down, we can see clearly it is involving infralateral territory. Yes. Okay, good. Yeah. And this is a male, okay. Yeah. Very good. So what are you thinking about now? You know he's got, you know he's got, uh, you know he's got a problem, right? Right. The study is not normal. Okay. So I would like to look around that area for, um, ball motion abnormality, which is hard to comprehend from my end, but um, So globally, his ejection fraction goes from 61 to 69 but in the affected region, obviously it's beginning to lag a little bit, right? Okay. A little bit. Mm -hmm. It's not thickening to the same uh, to the same degree. So, should he go to the cath lab? Is the question, right? So, uh, you know, my experience over the years has been that uh, you report something like this, that there's a perfusion defect infralaterally. It's uh, small to moderate in size, it's moderate in severity. Um, you know, the cath guys are always fearful that, that we might be missing something. So probably going to end up going to the cath lab. Now, now if, if we can add something more here from the flow standpoint, then uh, maybe we can uh, influence this one way or another. So, so here are the flows, okay? And in the circumflex as expected, you know, the flows are, are reduced compared to the LED and the right coronary territory. But as we might've thought, from the appearances and the ejection fraction changes, globally the flow has gone up very nicely. So, it is still one point eight times the resting. You would still two point eight. Two point eight. Okay. And uh, when we when we look, and you probably can't see this very well, but when we look at the 17 segment model, flows augment everywhere just fine, except for this little area, okay, where they augment uh, 1.38. And I can't read that even myself, 1.8, I think. So it's, 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 it's really two segments. Turns out it's two segments that are abnormal. So what do you think now? Coronary artery calcium score is 1,874. This is a 73 year old man. He's got, uh, he had a non ischemic regadenous inspect in 2018. He's now being seen because he thinks he's having some exertional dyspnea. He came in for the routine visit. Uh, 
he said he sometimes gets exertional uh, tightness and the PET was ordered. I would cut him. Okay, so, so what, what we have learned in the era of PET is that this is a uh, fairly small area. As I mentioned, it's two segments. He's got really rich, very good flood, blood flow reserve in the LED and RCA territories. Even uh, much of the circumflex territory has got good flow reserve. Um, uh, the ejection fraction goes up. There's no transient ischemic dilation. Um, we wouldn't hesitate on this, on a, something like this, to uh, administer medications uh, first. And uh, if he is rendered uh, asymptomatic and can do what he wants, uh, we wouldn't think about sending him to the cath lab. But you know, if this was a spec study, you'd be absolutely right. You would, uh, you would be thinking of, of, of uh, going to the cath lab. Dr. Bateman, while you're getting the next one pulled up, there was a question from earlier that I thought was pretty good. The, um, especially in some of the images that Dr. McGee was showing, um, some of the RV uptake shows up very nicely on the PET imaging. Um, yeah. And what do you think the significance is of that? And does the resolution with the PET imaging cause any other issues when you're also looking at uh, areas outside the heart region? Uh, well, Ian may want to comment as well. Um, I, th I think that um, uh, it's nice to see the right ventricle better than what we do uh, with, uh, with SPEC. Uh, I love CZT SPEC, but we often don't see the right ventricle at all. I kind of miss that. Um, in many cases, we can actually quantify right ventricular ejection fraction uh, and volumes with, uh, with PET, uh, particularly with, uh, with digital PET. Um, certainly, the uh, uh, right ventricular enlargement uh, in patients with ischemia is, is more evident with PET than with SPEC. Okay, this, this fellow, uh, this is kind of an interesting case. So um, this fellow, this is a 79 year old man. He's got a prior history of hypertension, diabetes, DVT, he's on Xeralto, chronic kidney disease, stage three. Uh, he presented with cramps, he presented to hospital with cramps, weakness, and exertional dyspnea. He had a calcium score in 2018 of 2,375. He had an echo at the same year showing EF 65%. A few months ago, he was noted to have gained weight and had some exertional dyspnea. Uh, hydrochlorothiazide was stopped, chlorothalidone was uh, added, and a beta blocker was added. Aspirin was stopped because of excessive bruising. So um, his troponin was normal. Uh, he was noted to desaturate to 87% with ambulation on just room air. Chest x-ray was clear. CTA was negative for PE. His ECG was non-ischemic. So here he is in the ER with cramps, weakness, persisting exertional dyspnea, He's a big man, uh, and uh, here are his images. They're not good quality. You can take another volunteer to help with this. So um, uh, if there's no volunteer, you know, in the interest of time, uh, we thought this was a, a pretty poor quality study. Um, we thought this was a pretty poor quality study 
and um, there's evidence for motion artifact. You can see the heart has become kind of boxy and uh, doesn't look exactly what some of Ian's were, but we thought there was motion artifact here. Uh, the, um, the function, um, sorry. Is shown here. It's just not a very good quality study, is it? So we we're hoping flows might help us. These are his flows. So, you know, there's not much augmentation. Uh, we interpreted this study as follows, poor image quality with motion artifacts, equivocal abnormalities anteriorly and apically, EF 42% with mild global hypokinesis, Myocardial blood flow reserve was absent, suggesting the presence of circulating inhibitors. We recommended that the study be repeated. So the clinical team uh, decided that they weren't all that suspicious because he was complaining of cramps and weakness and some uh, dyspnea, but the dyspnea was chronic. And uh, as indicated, he desaturated with uh, exertion and he is 79 years old. So they sent him home. Uh, but they did arrange for an outpatient follow-up. Okay. And so he came back uh, as an outpatient and he got re-imaged. A little bit easier interpretation, isn't it? So now there's right. a, yeah. Right, it, I don't know, if, no volunteers for this one, but it looks like that there's um, a pretty clear anterior reversible defect, kind of uh, almost all the way throughout uh, base to apex um, and certainly uh, septal reversible defect as well. Right. So anterior and septal right from the base to the apex and around the apex. Mm -hmm. What about the lateral wall? The lateral wall is also reversible as well. Yeah. What about the cavity? Looks like there's TAD present. Yeah. And like you were mentioning before, the LV looks much more appropriate. It seems like right. the motion artifact is much improved now. Yeah. And it looks like there's significant wall motion in, in those territories as well. Yeah. Yeah. Big change. And so, um, and uh, now look at his flows. Oops, that's the old one. So yeah, I think these are very impressive with uh, the flow reserve um, globally at 1.7 and especially worse in the LAD territory and left cert territory compared to the RCA. Yeah, exactly. I think this is everything put together again, another high risk study and um, would recommend a cath. Yeah. So he turned out to have uh, a 90% left main lesion. Okay, he had some scattered additional disease, but it was all kind of in the moderate uh, type category. But, but I think, you know, the major uh, teaching point here, I think, is, is uh, we have enough problem with, with um, inhibitors, predominantly caffeine, in patients who we see as uh, elective outpatients 
uh, in our lab. But when you, when you uh, start looking at people coming into the emergency room, uh, I mean, they're not prepped and they're being given medications in the ED and uh, who knows how much caffeine or caffeine substances they may have had. And uh, uh, PET is so helpful in the assessment of those people who are not necessarily uh, uh, ideally prepped to, to tip you off that the patient didn't really have a, a, uh, a stress augmentation. Um, so, so we always favor PET in those types of, of scenarios. If this was a, if the first study here had been a spec, uh, there's a there's a reasonable chance that uh, we would have called it a a poor quality study, possibly you know, or just a poor quality study, and um, uh, without kind of saying we don't think the patient had a real stress test. Uh, I don't know that anybody would have even thought of bringing them back for a, a test a week later. Okay. Uh, there's there's a quick question on the quality uh, colors on the left side of the screen. Oh, over here. Yeah. Okay. So yeah. So these these are uh, indices. Uh, these are quality control indicators uh, that are helpful for um, for given us assurances that, uh, that our flow numbers are, are good. So things like uh, peak to plateau, okay, we like to see uh, certain signals there. That, now th this is software specific, so I don't, need, I don't need or want to go into any particular details here. How long it took to get from uh, baseline to the uh, peak uh, of the uh, uh, tracer within the uh, regions of interest and the uh, noise configurations of the, of the study. Um, these are, are some of the indices that we use to give us uh, some degree of confidence that our, our, uh, that our data is for flow quantification is reliable. We tend to look at, the, at these things more. Uh, in the net retention models, uh, there's, there's less sensitivity to things like patient motion and uh, and bolus configurations than there is with the uh, compartment uh, models. Um, you can use, as I mentioned, you know, you can there's 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 different um, uh, flow models out there. Um, uh, you just have to be familiar with your own uh, with your own software. Okay, are there any other questions? I guess it's three o'clock or four o'clock East time. Yeah, almost time. So Tim, uh, let me take a moment to thank you and Ian and Kyle, really outstanding presentations and a great review of cardiac pet, including artifacts all the way from basics to uh, coronary flow reserve, really top quality cases. So thank you very much again uh, for taking time to teach all the fellows. And um, we hope to see all of you tomorrow. Tomorrow is the last session, and it will be 2 to 4 p.m. tomorrow. Hope to see you all tomorrow. Thank you, everyone. Thanks. Thanks, Tim. Bye. Mm -hmm.